started off right. Matthew chapter 22, verse number 1. Ready for a change, amen? I tell you, that's what our world needs. Uh, we need a change, amen? We need a change, spiritually speaking, uh, and, and, and need it bad, amen? We need, uh, everybody talking about a fix for what's going on in our country. The only thing that's going to fix our country is God. A return to the cross, no doubt about that. Matthew chapter 22, verse number 1 says, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king which made a marriage of his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they would, but they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise, and, to, and the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. Boy, I tell you what, what an insult on this king. What an insult on him. I tell you what, that's where we are now. Amen. People will not come. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and, to the, and, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So the servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found. Both bad and good. Hallelujah for that. I'm glad I got in on the bad line. Amen. I'm thankful that God uh, accepts the sinners. And the wedding was furnished with guests. They all looked the same. Hallelujah when they got there. Bad and good. Didn't matter. We all looked good when we were there. Amen. Thank God for that. And when the king came in to see the guest, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into the outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen let us pray father we thank you so much for this awesome day uh, god we celebrate it with all the men in this room fathers lord they sacrifice so much time and, and thanks for their family that nobody even ever knows about and god i want to honor them today and i god we honor uh, them with, with, with just 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 to uh, give them a little something lord and let them have a great day uh, to celebrate with their families but god we pray now uh, for this moment uh, that you give us here for this service. God, help us all to realize and look deep inside our own hearts as this week starts out and understand that uh, we all have something maybe that we need to commit back to you. But God, we pray for a change, not just for our church, but for our community and for our country. But God, it starts right here at High Ridge Baptist Church. I believe that we could spark something right here that can change the community and in turn change the nation. And I believe that it could do it starting right here. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for all that you do. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be saved. We find out this parable, uh, and as I said, uh, there's some things out of this you may have heard, but I want to share something out of this I believe will be a blessing to you uh, from this scripture, and will also be over uh, in 1 Samuel here in just a few minutes. But a king made a marriage for his son. Verse number 4, this king said to them, Come now, because things were ready. It's time to get bold in our faith. Amen. And quit worrying about what folks might say about us. They, they're going to say you're crazy whether you uh, are or not. Whether you serve God or not, people's going to have things to say about you. People are going to talk about you uh, whether uh, they talk about you for serving Jesus or whether they don't. And I want something to happen this week at our church. Amen. I want to 
see a change uh, in people. I'd love to see folks come and be saved. I'd love to see uh, even Christians change. I'd love to see something in me change. And I'm looking for that this week. Verse number 5. Some think that this may have happened around 80 A.D. when Jerusalem was burned down. Now, verse number 8. The king was mad because the ones that were invited, the Bible said, they were not worthy. They were not worthy. Amen. I want you to see this. Their worthiness was connected to their willingness. What makes us worthy is not just our behavior, but what makes us worthy is how hungry we are. Amen. How hungry we are. Because he connected their worthiness, if you'll notice, to their willingness. Because uh, So since they were not willing, they were not worthy. Had nothing to do with anything else. They just wasn't worthy because they wasn't willing to come. That's the big thing you got to see. They've got to be willing to come. He didn't ask them anything. He didn't ask them to provide anything. He just asked them to be willing to come to the wedding. Verse number 10 said that they went to get as many as they found, both bad and good. I love that verse. The first group, if you think about it, the first group would have had Pharisees, Sadducees, uh, the, the the high priest in it, but they weren't worthy uh, because they weren't willing. But the second group was willing, and it even had some bad folks in it. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God for that. Amen. Because I want you to know, I wouldn't have been a part of the first group, but blessed be to God, I might have been in the second group. Amen. And he come and got the bad people and said they could come. I say, I ain't worthy, but bless God, I'm willing, and I'll come if you'll have me. Amen. I'm thankful uh, for that. But God can do more. Listen now. God can do more with people who have problems that are hungry than he can with those that pretend they don't and stay just like they are. Amen. See, we'll never really get free and we'll quit pretending and posing like we're not struggling with things. I want our church to be a place where we can say that we have issues, but we're still willing and hungry. Amen. You can't hide the fact that we have issues. Everybody has them. But we're hungry and we're willing to do something different. Amen. That's where it's at. You don't have no perfect churches because you don't have no perfect people. Amen. The only people you have that act like they're perfect is the ones that are pretending and posing like they have no problems. Everybody in here, if you deal with stuff the week in and week out, we're all going to have problems. We all have issues. We all have things we face that some people don't know anything about. Amen. But they are willing. God's looking for people with a willing heart. Amen. I may hang out right there all day. Thank God for that. He didn't qualify us and you because you're perfect. You're qualified because you're covered by the blood of his dear son. Come on, somebody. That's good, amen. His only begotten son covered me with his blood. Listen, verse number 11. It is what I want you to focus on for a few minutes, and I'll let you go. The king saw a man that did not have on the right garment, the wedding garment, and asked him, how did you get in here unnoticed how did you get in here unnoticed here's the deal everybody else there saw this man and didn't know see there's things this morning i look out i can't see i'm ahead of myself but when god looks down he sees what the preacher and nobody else can when the king walked in he knew he, oh, golly, I'm really getting ahead of my, when the king walked in, he knew there was one in there that didn't look right. He said, how did you get in here? Listen, now flip over to 1 Samuel chapter 18. I'm going to hurry through this, but I got somewhere I want to get here in just a few minutes, and I want to show you this. Amen. I'm thankful for this. I want to show you something about covenant and how important covenant is. 1 Samuel, and we've talked out of this before, but it's worth mentioning again. 1 Samuel chapter 18, Jonathan and David here, verse number 1 says this, And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, the soul of Jonathan, the Bible said, was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant 
made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe and this that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments even to his sword and his bow down to his girdle. Listen, the covenant between David and Jonathan looked like two men that was willing to take their clothes off in front of one another to participate, as we talked about before, in the process of exchange. But you can't have covenant without violence vulnerability. Amen. You can't have covenant if you're hiding things, you understand. To have true covenant means to bear all with one another. You have, may have covenant, but you don't have true covenant because you're hiding things. We are good at hiding stuff from one another. Amen. We are always trying to hide hidden secrets and private parts. Amen. The way the couple, two couple, a couple gets married, the way they complete the covenant of marriage, as we said before, is being willing to be completely uncovered in front of one another. That completes the covenant of marriage. The reason we can't have that kind of covenant with each other now is because we don't want folks to see the real us. That's truth. That's truth, amen. We don't want people to see the real us. We're afraid that they won't like us if, we, if they know who I really am. Am. Amen. Many folks can't have a real covenant relationship with each other because they won't bear all to God. And how can I come have a complete relationship with you if I don't have a complete race relationship with Him? Amen. Big deal, man. Hey, man, I'm telling you, this is the truth. How many times we don't just try to hide from each other? Listen to me. Here's the thing. I'm not saying all y'all tell everybody all your secrets. That's not where I'm going. <laughs> but I am telling you this. We try to hide from God, do we not? Yeah. I do it. I do it. There's things going on like God don't already know. God knows all about me. He knows what's going on inside of me. He knows what I try to keep hidden uh, from him and everybody else and loves me anyway. Listen, man, we have to be able to become uh, true covenant partners and be able to have true covenant with each other and have true covenant with God. That's what David and Jonathan was demonstrating here. David and Jonathan had a spirit of connection. That is why it was love at first sight. The Bible even says that the love David had for Jonathan surpassed the love of a woman. Listen, there's nothing weird there either. Let me just stop and say that right here. All right? And I've said this before, but the reason John, uh, David knew how to love Jonathan better, he didn't know how to love a woman. And, and neither did his son, as far as that goes. We've already known that in Sunday school. Amen. But he had a special place for Jonathan in his heart. That was a true brotherly love that they had, an awesome relationship to have with somebody. And if you have that with somebody, praise God for it. Amen. They just ain't much of it. Amen. But David and Jonathan had that. Now, in this, in this picture... The picture, this is so good. The picture of true covenant. Notice it says that he, they took off, that Jonathan took off his armor. Covenant says that I am defenseless against you. Amen. The definition of covenant, covenant is this. Me knowing enough about you to hurt you, but choosing not to. That's the definition of true covenant. Hey, man, me knowing enough about you to hurt you and choosing not to. That's what David and Jonathan were demonstrating right here. They were taking down their guard physically. But it was showing us how we are to interact with people that we are in covenant with. My wife knows more about, as much about me as God knows about me. And I'm like, if she chooses to sit there and stay with me, you ain't got no excuse. <laughs> Amen. So come to church. Amen. Listen, uh, they, 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 they showed us here. He's taken off his armor uh, in front of him. He takes off his sword. He says, I don't want to have anything. I don't want to have anything on my person to hurt you with. I love that, man. I love that so much. I've been thinking about this, man, for the last two or three weeks. Now, we don't know. A lot of people don't know anything about that kind of covenant because here's the way people are in our day, and I'm trying not to be harsh, but here's the deal. People will say, I'm, I'm for you as long as we agree. And, boy, that's the truth. But the moment we disagree, I'm coming at you. Hey, man. As long as we agree, I'm fine. But the moment that we don't, you better have your armor on because I kept my sword. <laughs> Isn't that a shame? Hey, man. Christians, and listen to this. I, this is so uh, worth saying. Christians 
have become masters at killing one another. Amen? Become masters of it. Take off his bow. He said, I don't even want nothing to hurt you from a distance. He took his sword off so he couldn't kill him up close. He said, I'm going to take my bow off because you know what? It's a whole lot easier to kill somebody when they ain't looking than it is up close and personal. Some of them are so mean, they'll stab you right up close. Jonathan said, I'm taking off my bow. He said, I don't even want to hit you at a distance. He said, even when your back's turned and you ain't looking, I don't want nothing to hurt you with. Whole lot easier to talk about somebody when they ain't paying no attention and they got their back turned. Man, this is good. I hope you get a hold of this, man. This is so, so good. Took off his bow. He didn't want nothing to hurt him from a distance. This is so good right here. Now, this is what covenant looks like. The robe, oh, this is awesome. The robe, Jonathan's robe, Jonathan's robe would have been identification of royalty because people back then wore things that identified who they belonged to. You with me? Hey, Amen. So, oh, this is good. His robe would have communicated to everyone that he was of the royal line, that, that he was the prince. King in waiting is what, how he would have been dressed. Amen. Oh, that's so good. Like folks that wear basketball jerseys, they ain't going to be playing in. Hey, man, we dress for style, do we not? You see people up in the stands, they're shorter than me and fatter than me with LeBron's jersey on. They ain't going to call you to get in, big guy, I promise. They got, they've got substitutes. People now dress for style. They didn't do that back then. They didn't do that back then. They're, they're, they, what they wore, oh God, communicated who they belonged to. Amen. Everything that they wore. Listen, their garment communicated legacy and connection. That's why we talked about before, blind Bartimaeus takes off his cloak before he comes to Jesus to get his vision. Amen. Because once he takes that off, he needed to take off what folks that made folks recognize him as a blind man, you see. That's why they gambled for Jesus' garments because they, they communicated that he was of a royal line. They gambled for the garments of Christ, man. Hey, listen, that's what happened. Now, listen, that's why David dressed like a shepherd because that's what he was. So David and Jonathan switched clothes because the shepherd is really the prince. Yeah. Hallelujah. Oh, it's so good, man. That's awesome. David the shepherd was the true prince in waiting. Jonathan didn't even know what he was doing. He was taking off his princely robe and said, David, I'm going, my God, I'm going to robe you in something that's your future in waiting. Amen. Yeah, but when you give me that, that's communicating to everybody that you're no longer the prince. And Jonathan said, yeah, I don't care where the princely line comes through as long as it comes through the right one. So I'm going to take off this robe and put it on its rightful owner because he is the one that's in the bloodline of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Y'all better get excited. I'm going to start throwing songbooks. Amen. Amen. I can't even see. I got my glasses off. I can't see if you're happy or not. Amen. But he took off. That robe placed it on his rifle owner. Amen. The prince, the true prince, the shepherd. Now think about how this would mess people up. Amen. Uh, the, the, the things they were doing. He, the Bible said, he who knew no sin uh, became sin that I, that I through him might be made the righteousness of God. There was an exchange that this man who knew no sin took on my sin so I could take off my sin and put on him. Hallelujah. Amen. This is really good. I think I've shared this before, but it's worth mentioning. There's a story, and you farmers and people that's ever dealt with cattle will know what I'm talking about. There's a story about two cows in a field that were ready to calf. They were fixing to have babies. So one of them birthed two calves, twins. Well, the mama, one cow, apparently they tell me, didn't have enough resources to, to be able to nurse both calves. 
So what happened, there was another cow that had a calf, and her calf died. So what they did, the, 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 the farmers had a thought, and they cut the skin. <laughs> this is good. They cut the skin off of the dead calf and placed that skin on one of the twins. And then the mom that had the milk of the dead calf, if you follow me, accepted the twin as her own, not because of who he was, but because of what he had on. Oh, my. I was hoping you'd get that. That's awesome. So, therefore, we see that she accepted him. He wasn't hers, you see. She accepted him because she what he had on. Oh, somebody. Listen. See, you and me should have been... You and me should have been rejected and thrown away, but I put on him when I got saved, but I can't come on him. I can't come uh, over him and be a part of him and put him over this. I had to take off my mess, you see, to put him on over this. So therefore, when God looks down, he don't see my unworthiness and how hopeless I am. He sees his son because his son, I'm covered by the blood of his only begotten son. That's why God sees you as his kid. Not because you're worthy, but because of what you got on. Hallelujah, man. That's good. Give God a hand clap of praise. Yes. I'll get, I'll get you started in revival if it kills me. I promise you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Listen, see, we like to talk about salvation without transformation, but that's no salvation at all. Jesus is not an accessory. He's a God of exchange. See, when you accept Jesus, you repent and accept. Therefore, God creates a place of exchange. Now, studying the culture, listen, I want to go back to this just for a moment. Now look back at Matthew 22, if you would, with me. Just a moment. I'm just about done. Matthew 22. We go back over there. So the first group don't come to the wedding feast, so the servants went back out and got all random people. That's how me and you got here. Amen? Because the ones that were invited didn't come, which represents Israel. But he went back out and got all the bad ones. I love it when it said that. The bad and the good, Jay, because I was part of that bad group. The old Gentiles, amen, the dogs. That's a true sign of what this is talking about too. But look here. Now, I know some uh, people uh, were probably on that first list, but the rest of us were willing to admit that after they started scraping the bottom of the barrel, that's when they got to my name. Hallelujah. He said, go get some that want it. See, I hear, I, I'm here because I'm willing, and he made me able. Amen. You're here because you're willing, not because you're worthy. Don't misunderstand. And a lot of people, that they've been there, a while they start thinking they move from willingness to worthiness i'm thankful to god i don't get what i deserve you hear me because if i did i'd be in hell this morning with the gate locked but because i was willing hallelujah he made me able he made me worthy not because i'm anything don't ever come to a place and think well i'm worthy now no you're not Amen. You're only there because uh, you was willing to accept his dear son. Now, here's the problem with the bad and the good. Here's, this is what messed me up on this. Here's the problem with the bad people uh, and, and things. The bad people don't have the right thing to wear. Come on, listen now. So the story is a little frustrating, if you'll be honest, because the king who's the master of the feast starts kicking people out because they don't have the right clothes on. I said, if you'd have wanted that, big boy, you should have not kicked out the first group. Come on now. You go start getting bad people, you can't expect them to be dressed right. Come on, this is going to get good. Listen, so if you wanted people to be dressed right, you should have went and got all the bad, you shouldn't have went and got all the bad people, amen, so, and stuck with the good people because the bad people are not going to have the right thing on. Now, studying the culture, and this is where I want to share with you, studying the culture, uh, when they invited someone to a wedding, this is good, they were no longer responsible for their attire. 
Oh, this is awesome. Now, we do this somewhat in our day, if you'll remember, if you, if you notice in weddings now, because the grooms dress alike, all the bridesmaids and, the, and the bride, uh, all the bridesmaids and all them, they all dress alike. But back in this day and time, everybody dressed alike. They all wore the same thing. You say, I ain't in the tux if I ain't in the wedding. <laughs> Amen. I'm wiggy. I ain't buying no tux if I'm in the wedding. You better be if you want me to be a part of it. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Amen. But listen, the tradition, oh, this is so good. Now, but, but in their culture, everyone at the wedding ceremony dressed alike. So, therefore, the tradition is the father of the bride, and most of y'all probably know this, the father of the bride had to pay a dowry to see the coming together of the son and the daughter. Oh, but see, this was, oh God, this was the master of the son. Uh, it was his son getting married. Now, check this out. But the father of the groom had to provide the wedding garment for every person that was to attend the wedding. So therefore, so the man that wasn't dressed right, it was not because, and you see this guy comes in and he sees everybody's dressed right, but one didn't have on the garment that the king provided. Follow me now. He had on the garment. He didn't have the right stuff on. It wasn't that he didn't have the right thing to wear because he didn't have any, or he hadn't had the right thing to wear. It, it was because he was not willing to participate in the process of exchange right before he came into the wedding. That's the problem. Now this scripture makes a whole lot more sense to me because when you see him, he goes out and gets bad and good people and then he comes in and one of the guys that are bad people were there, didn't have the right thing on, but I didn't know the culture, amen. And when I found out that, hey, when you come in, he gives you something to put on, but the problem is this. He come in and he can't put that on over this, so you, my God, you got to remove this to put on what he gave you because the Bible said that when I got saved, God robed me in righteousness and you can't put that over this mess so you have to participate in the process of exchange right. amen? amen so he didn't put on the wedding garment but he had it provided for him now you can see why the anger of the king the master of the supper was so mad he comes in he's like hey I provided it I bought it all I ask you to do is put it on but here's where we're at this is how it relates in our day people will come and they say, I'll come, but I don't want to change. I want to come sing Amazing Grace, and I want to come listen to the preaching, and I want to hoop and holler, but I don't want to change. And that's the problem. So the king comes in, and he sees somebody dancing to the music and singing out loud, but he ain't dressed right because he said, I'm not telling you you had to dress in any certain way. I'm not even telling you to buy and provide the garment. I'm telling you you should have put on what I gave you to put on free of charge because you accepted my invitation. And when Jesus, that's how you get saved, you see, because when God, when you get saved, you don't go any other way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. And when you come to the Father after coming through me, I put something on you that only he can recognize. Come on, somebody. I can't tell in here who's saved, but when God looks down from heaven, he can tell who belongs to him and who don't. Because the way that you're dressed. Hallelujah. I'm done because I'm about dead, but that's awesome. <laughs> Amen. He wasn't dressed right, you see. You look at that, the first part of it, and you see it, and you're like, man, that's, that's awful rough on the bad people because I don't know if I'd have been dressed right either. And God reminds me, oh, yes, you was because I provided you the robe. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. I provided uh, you the robe. So when the king came in, he said, how in the world did you get in here? He was provided the right thing to wear, but he wasn't willing to take some things off and put on the garment. Listen, I believe that High Ridge Baptist Church could see a move like never before, and he's not asking, what can you bring to the table? He's asking, what can you take off? Come on, somebody. He's asking, can you take more of me? Then you've got to take less of you. He's saying, I know 
know why you're uncomfortable because you've been wearing the wrong thing. I've got something that fits you so good that when you put him on, uh, it will set you free. Hallelujah, man. That's what it takes. Let's stand to our feet. Head bows, eyes closed. This week, I pray that we make this altar a place of exchange for revival. There's going to be some men coming and giving great testimonies, and these young men back here are fired up and going to be giving testimony and preaching to us. So you're going to hear the word this week. A lot of people, hopefully some folks will come in this place that will visit, and they might come in. And they might not be quite dressed right. But God's inviting them and said, hey, when you come, I'll give you the clothes. I'll robe you in what you need. You might not be worthy, but just be willing to come. Just be willing to come. You know, when I got saved, that's what he asked. He said, I just want you to be willing. I said, God, I don't know if I can do the Christian thing. I don't know if I can live up to what you expect. He said, I didn't ask you to live up to it. I didn't ask you to bring anything to the table. He said, I ask you to be willing to come. And I did. I said, God, if you'll have me, I'll serve you. I might not be the best you ever had, and I know I'm not going to be. I'm the worst of the worst. And I'll not be able to do it all right, but if you'll have me, I'll serve you. I'll serve you the longest day I live. I'll do everything I can to be your servant. And he said, that's all I'm asking for. See, the Bible says, he that began a good work in you will bring it to completion. I don't have nothing to do with the completing part either. Too many people, after they've been saved, they think, well, I ought to be there by now. I ought to be a part. I ought to be good. I ought not be marred anymore. Sometimes he had to remake it. He don't throw nothing away. God don't manufacture junk. You just got to be willing to change. You got to be willing to say, God, if you'll have me, here I am. I surrender all to you. And I, if you'll accept me, here I am. What about you this week? What about people in here? Listen, there'll be people coming. I want you to be praying. I want you to come back this week. I want you to come ready to worship and ready to uh, serve and ready to do everything you can to see folks saved. Be praying. Invite people to come, man. If you have a need this morning, you want to pray about revival, you want to pray for yourself or whatever your need is this morning. If Tammy starts singing, I want you to come. Go ahead. Now.